Hey guys, I'm presenting on uh, Kevin J. Van Hooser's article on Augustinian inerrancy, the importance of literary meaning, literal truth, and literate interpretation in the economy of biblical discourse. I thought this chapter was really helpful, um, and he highlights a lot of really important things that when it comes to the doctrine of inerrancy, um, he begins by explaining and arguing that when it comes to the doctrine of inerrancy, the conversation must be well-versed because there's such co complexity in Scripture, because it's a book that's comprised of different languages and different pieces of literature. And so he uses the example of uh, Jesus teaching parables and says that when we approach Jesus teaching a parable, we have to ask, what kind of truth is Jesus teaching in that parable? And that sort of helps us get to the bottom of what the parable is all about. And if we, at, if we come to the conclusion of Jesus is teaching some other type of truth, then we're missing the point of that passage altogether. And then he then goes into a conversation explaining the state of the question of inerrancy when in within evangelicalism. And he talks about the difference between infallibists and inerrantists. Infallibists believe that God's word is sufficient in communicating truth about faith and practice, whereas inerrantists believes that that even applies to history and science. And he poses the question, is inerrancy a decisive distraction or an essential feature. He argues that inerrancy is needed in evangelicalism today, but it is not essential. He would argue that it takes a well-versed inerrancy that takes into account the complexity of scripture in order for us to rightly have a doctrine of inerrancy in evangelicalism. And this led into him having a conversation about the Chicago Statement, and he has a few issues with it and critiques of it. Um, the first, or he breaks it down into four cate categories. The first is whether its definition of inerrancy is clear. The second is whether it gives primacy to a biblical, theological, rather than a philosophical understanding of truth. The third is whether it is sufficiently attentive to the nature and function of language and literature. And the fourth is whether it produced a theological novelty. And he argues that the doctrine of inerrancy, um, through a conversation on the Chicago Statement, he argues that the doctrine of in inerrancy needs to be freed from cultural and historical locatedness that has ultimately affected its core meaning. And so when he gets to the end of the conversation on the Chicago Statement, he um, comes to the conclusion that the Chicago Statement has been affected by cultural and historical locatedness and that that has impacted the core meaning of inerrancy. He then continues to give an example of a historical person um, that highlights what he means by well-versed inerrancy. Um, and he talks about Augustine as that person and he springboards off of that example uh, to begin to give a biblical theological definition of inerrancy, since he thought that the Chicago Statement definition was insufficient. And he explains, I, I love this part, he explains how amazing it is that God speaks, but better yet, he makes covenants with his people, which is one of the most powerful and important acts of speech that we have. And he then gives a discussion on how God uses language. And he talks about the need to discern um, a literal sense of a specific passage before making statements on it being true or false. And so he's arguing that we have to understand literacism in order to have a proper conversation about God's truth because he spoke through our language. And so we have to do the work to understand language and to understand literary uh, structures and devices. And this is why he goes into um, 
a conversation on hermeneutics, and he poses the question, is the Bible's truth somehow dependent on its interpreters? And the answer is, is that the Bible teaches truth whether or not its students learn their lesson. And I thought that was really powerful. He emphasizes the need that we have to recognize what the biblical authors are doing with their words in order to interpret scripture rightly. And ultimately in that he's arguing that inerrancy doesn't get rid of the need for a proper hermeneutic. And it, at the, towards the end of this, this article, he gives three examples of how um, inerrancy has caused an issue in three different texts of Scripture um, because of the fact that, that there has been a lack of well-versed um, inerrancy. And so the first example he gives is Joshua 6 about the fall of Jericho and if there was an actual historical fall and how the archaeological evidence seems to apparently contradict um, what the scriptures say. And he explains that archaeology simply just says how something may have happened, but it cannot limit the fact that God acted. And that is why it's important for us to understand how the biblical authors used language. Because if they're using language in a specific way to describe how God acted, but to make a point about how God acted, the archaeology may con contradict what the biblical author said, but it doesn't change the fact that God still acted in a certain way. And the second example he gives is uh, apparent contradictions between two of the accounts of Paul on the road to Damascus. And he highlights... Uh, one very important rhetorical tool that ancient authors used about how repetition of a story with slight variations was often something that ancient authors used to make a point and how that doesn't change the overall point they're trying to make them using that tool. And so this again highlights our need to be well-versed in language and in lit literature, um, including literary tools and devices. And the third example he gives is Deuteronomy, or it's about Deuteronomy 20, 16 through 17, and how that supposedly contradicts Matthew 5, 43 through 48, um, because it brings up the question, did God command genocide? And if he did, then that must contradict his uh, statement on loving your enemies. And I really, really liked, uh, I just want to highlight one part of that conversation, but I liked how in discussing this topic, he drove home the point that the violence in the Old Testament is very typological because it points to his utter destruction of evil in the violence inflicted on Jesus on the cross that brought salvation to all people. And so again, he's pointing to the need to look at the biblical author's purpose in using specific words and, and using language to communicate a truth. And if that purpose of the author was to point to uh, the utter destruction of evil through the violence inflicted on Jesus, then it seems that um, that kind of clears up some of the confusion uh, with this passage. It doesn't clear up all of it, but I think that's the most important takeaway I had from that section where he talked about those two passages. And he concludes his article ultimately by saying, and I, I thought this was really cool, that a sound doctrine of inerrancy is, is going to require a community of well-versed men and women who are capable of understanding, loving, and participating in truth.